So, firstly, whoever's with me, welcome to the final of the four se in the series that we've done uh, for you. Um, in this theory, in this particular class, what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, some real desserts, spoily desserts, and um, I will go through them and demonstrate it all to you and a bit of healthy eating to offset it. In this series, what we've tried to do is look at very simple and sustainable and seasonal recipes that you can do. Um, and with, when we planned it, we were in the middle of lockdown. So we were talking about things you would have in your cupboard. Like the first session was on tomatoes, using a tin of tomatoes in many ways. So we did that. Um, and each session has been based on something that we think has been relevant at the time. But after all the serious cooking and talking about food, we decided we had to do something that was a bit of a splurge as well. So today we are going to do some profiteroles. Everyone always thinks that eclairs or profiteroles are really tricky, but they are so straightforward. So we're going to start off doing some profiteroles, which I'm going to get into the oven. I'm going to turn the oven on now. I always turn it on just before we need it because we don't want to use waste electricity. I'm sure at risk of repeating myself that the energy that goes into heating an oven of all that energy, all that you use in an electric oven is about 6% of all the energy. So you only want to use it at the last moment. And in fact, you also want to, when possible, you want to try and use your oven for as much as you can so that you really are utilizing that energy well. Um, when I'm doing something, I put a tray of vegetables into roast or something like that that I'll use the next day or that evening so that the energy that I am using in the oven is used to its full extent. So we're going to make profiteroles, as I've just said. Then I'm going to show you how to make the most wonderful chocolate mousse. It's an olive oil chocolate mousse. It's become a cookery school firm favorite and it's just olive oil, dark chocolate and eggs and a bit of brandy, of course. Just give it that extra little bit of pizzazz. And you can make it the day before, absolutely beautiful. And as you probably know, in gut health, the things that are really good for you are olive oil and chocolate is also something that is acknowledged now to be fine. It's a fermented food, as is red wine, and it just adds to the variety of what you're eating. Very, very good for gut health are artichokes. So I'm going to, to offset all this richness and deliciousness that we're having. I'm going to show you how to prepare some artichokes, and we'll do artichokes vinaigrette, really easy, very seasonal and delicious. And then, because we're so into waste, I'm going to show you what you can do with a wilted old lettuce or a bit of chicory. Anything that's in your fridge that you're going to throw away, you can make into a really fantastic starter or at cookery school, we've even sometimes used wilted lettuce as a dessert, as a side dish rather. Um, and we spice it up with a beautiful anchovy dressing. So at the very end, I will show you how to do the savory things, but we need to put our artichokes on to boil. So what I tend to do, cut the bottoms off. There we go. And um, I'll just cut the very bottom off because contrary to what most people like, I love the stalks. So I'll just pull off the leaves. And especially when they're young, I just eat the stalks on their own. And what I'm going to do, these are two gorgeous Riverford artichokes. I'm going to take them and I'm going to put them into a pan of boiling water. But they tend to pop up. I always have a problem with artichokes because they pop up and I want them kept under the water. So what I do is I usually get a bowl and of water and I fill it. I'll show you what I'm going to do. I fill a bowl with water and I weight it that weights down 
the artichoke. They don't bounce up. Been my way of doing it. I'm sure there are other ways of doing them, but I tend to just put them in like that, and that, with water in it, holds them down. So let's turn that on. And I'll pop that onto the big heat. Here we go. And we'll just leave that to boil away while we're doing everything else. We can forget about them. And when you, you know that your artichokes are ready, when you pull a leaf off and it comes off easily. If we tried to pull a leaf off now, it wouldn't come off. It's very tight. But as it cooks and we pull a leaf off, we'll know it's cooked because it's able to do that. So we'll leave that to cook away. Now let's look at doing a nice uh, profiterole. This pastry is called a shoe pastry, C-H-O-U-X. We once gave a corporate event the chance, verbally, of making a shoe pastry. They had loads of books, they could look through them, they even had La Rousse Gastronomique, which is the sort of chef's dictionary, and they had finished everything else they had to do, and they simply didn't know how to do a shoe pastry. And they kept on saying, we can't even find a recipe for shoe, because they were spelling it S-H-O-E. So once they knew it was a C-H-O-U-X, they were away. And you can make your shoe, which is your basic pup, your pastry that you're going to make your profiteroles with. If you drop them by teaspoonfuls onto a tray, they're called profiteroles and they come up puffy. If you want eclairs, you put them into a piping bag and you can pipe them into lengths, however long you like, and bake them then. If you want a savoury profiterole, you can take your mix, your shoe, and you can add, best of all, is Gruyere or Emmental, but they're really nice with Parmesan, and they're quite trendy these days. And you drop teaspoonfuls, small spoons, onto a tray, and you bake them, and you get very cheesy uh, little shoe buns, but they're tiny, called Gougier, and you have them with a drink. Traditionally, Gougier wasn't small. Traditionally, Gougier was dropped on to a tin, quite large, and you drop them next to each other in a circle. And as they rose, they would hit each other, and you'd get this connected circle of very cheesy, gorgeous pastry. And you would just break off bits and have that with your wine. Very, very delicious. Okay, so how do we go about making our shoe? You want some water weighed out and some butter. I'm using some butter I made at Christmas at, after lockdown. We had so much, it wasn't Christmas, I did it at Christmas as well actually, when we have a lot of cream left cookery school and no one wants to take it home. I take it home because it can't be wasted and I make butter with it. So that is some of my butter and all we're going to do is we're going to put it onto the cooker and we're going to let it melt together and just start to boil. Now, what we want to do is we want to break our eggs and we're going to break our eggs into a bowl so they're all ready to use. There we go. Break one egg and doing something you shouldn't do. I'll break this into here. You always have to break your egg into another container before you put any number of eggs together. Because if I drop that egg in there and it was a nasty egg, every now and then you might get an egg full of blood or one that's not great. You contaminate and you can't use the whole bowl of them. It's fine, you've only got two, but sometimes you can have a huge bowl of eggs and the last egg is awful, so you write off the whole lot. So always break your eggs into something else. Because I touched the egg, I'm just giving my hand a quick wash, and then I can come back to it very, very, very careful with eggs we are. So we now have, what do we have for our shoe? We have our eggs, and we have our butter and water melting away there, and then we've got some flour and some salt, a pinch of salt, and 
we're going to pop those away. And what we're going to do is when our butter and our water come up to the boil, the butter's melted, I'm going to take the flour and the salt and I'm going to whiz them in. I will show you that. I will do it in front of you and then I'll come back and cook it on the cooker. I'm going to mix them together and this is critical. What happens is it will form a ball. It will be a ball of butter, water and flour. And you mix it so hard and there's so much flour in it that it forms this ball that comes away from the side of the pan. And you cook it until it does that. So I will show you how you mix it, but you've got to mix it very quickly. And then once you've got your ball mixed, you're going to bit by bit add your eggs. I can hear that boiling. There we go, it's boiling. I could hear the sound, but the butter hasn't melted yet. I think my butter's a bit stubborn. It's almost there, but you want it really very, very hot. And everything dissolved. And there we go. That's our butter and water. There you go. Not a lot to see. And then I'm going to throw in the flour and um, the salt. And I'm going to mix them together. But you have to mix like mad. The reason is, if you don't, you're going to get it all not smooth and if you can see it's come away already in a ball from the side can you i'll just lift it to show you can you see that um and i'm just going to put it onto the heat for a moment and i'm just going to just cook it completely so that it's even more firm i'll turn the heat off but you really have this very well mixed ball. It's very clearly a ball now. It's come away really, really well from the side. I will show that to you. You'll see it's very, very clearly, whoopsie, a ball come away from the sides. Now, a lot of chefs at this point would just put this aside and forget about that. I've never, never done it a chef way, so I don't do it that way. I do add the eggs while it's hot. They, but there is a problem with adding them when they're hot because there's a bit of a risk. The risk is that this base doesn't like taking eggs. It resists them. So you've got to stir like mad. Now, you know that if you take an egg and you put it onto a hot surface, it scrambles. So we want to make sure it doesn't scramble. And to make sure it doesn't scramble, you've got to beat it like mad. So um, I will use, I'll bring a whisk just in case I need it. Um, I don't usually do this myself. Someone else usually does it because I'm not great. I'm left, I have to use my left hand and I'm not great with that. So I'm going to add the egg and very quickly, I'm going to mix it. Just mix, 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 mix. When we do this as a corporate event, everyone stand around and say, mix, 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 mix. And you've got to do it so fast. I'm going to actually use the whisk. I think it's going to be a bit easier. And I'm going to just mix, beat it in. Yes, it is easier for me. And I'm just beating it till it's good and smooth. There we go. But you can see it's still quite firm. But there's no egg and there's no omelet there. And I'm just going to keep beating because in fact, just so it's really smooth, this is beating in um, air. All of that is beating in a lot of air. I'll start it again. I'll put it in. You can probably see it steaming a bit. I'll put this in. I'll beat it. If I have a problem, I will swap and take the whisk again. But it really doesn't like going in. Now, this is where you need to use a little bit of common sense. It slips around. It really doesn't like going in. It's sliding all over the place. So I'm going to do the same thing again. I'm going to just see. Now, the common sense is you've got to have a mixture that is slips off the spoon. You don't want it to be hard. You want it to be um, a dropping mixture. Now, 
if you're mixed too, too hard, you have to mix some egg. So I'm getting another egg into it. So I'm going to show you the consistency and then I will show you why I think it needs another egg. Okay, let's get that out of here. There you go. It's much softer, but if you look at it, it's still like the luggy. It's hard. It's not dropping off my spoon. If you don't have it dropping off your spoon, you don't get a lovely um, profiterole that mixes in very easily. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another egg. Let's use one of these eggs and I'll replace it. I'm going to add another egg. Oh, bloody egg. So that you can see the reason full of blood that egg. So you can see my reason for saying you always test your egg before you use it. So let's do this. Let's pop another egg in. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just beat it. So we can just add as much of it as we want to. Just beat it lightly and I'll add about half. Because a whole egg may be too much and it might give us a mixture that's too thick. So I'm just beating it all in as much as I can. And you can see it's a little softer. I think that's possibly going to be all right. Let's show you. It's almost droppy. I think it could be a little droppier. I'd just like to drop off the spoon. I'll add a bit more of that. Just beat it in, and I think that will be it. Yeah, you don't want it runny. You want it quite firm, but you also want it to drop off your spoon. And that's the only thing that, why am I talking about it so much? Because if you follow a recipe exactly, sometimes it'll work perfectly. Other times it won't, because the problem is, that you can have variations in your egg size, you can have variations in the dryness of your flour, you might measure a little more one day, a little less another day, and if I show you now, you can see it's much it's thick, but it's dropping, which it wasn't doing before. I'll just give it a final beat, lovely and smooth, I'll pick it up and show it to you, and it's dropping off the whisk, there we go. Take that off there. And that is a really, really nice shoe. And I'll just give us a clean up where I've messed horribly. So we've got a clean work surface. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this mixture and I'm going to drop it by the teaspoonful onto either a buttered or a papered tin. I will use a papered tin. And I just need to wipe up once more because it's messy. Um, you really don't want to work with the mess. The cleaner you can keep your surfaces, the easier it is for cooking. And as you can see, as I cook, everything goes into the sink straight away. Because that way, um, all I have to do afterwards is wash it all up in there, but it's not hanging about the kitchen and messing it up. Right, so take a teaspoon, or if you want to, you could use a pastry bag, and you can just drop them on to the spoon. Now they are going to expand quite a lot as I cook them. So there you go, that's your, you can see it's dropping. I use a finger. I think there's nothing like a finger. And I just drop a spoonful on like that. You can see it's holding its shape. And I'm putting them quite far apart because they are going to expand as they go. That first one's a bit bigger than these. I want them all to be about the same, have about the same amount of mixture. So if you wanted to make long ones, you just take a pastry bag, pop this, fold it back so it doesn't get messy, 
pop your mixture in, put a nozzle in first, pop it into the bottom of your pastry bag, fill this into the pastry bag, and then you can just pipe length. But I'm not piping length, I am piping just profiteroles. And the rule is, uh, you can see I put three, and then I'm putting two. The rule is that you put odds and evens. You don't line them up like soldiers. You have to spread them out. Um, that gives you more space for spreading. So there we go. One, two, three. And I'll just turn this around and I'll do it on this side. And then we're going to pop them in the oven and they can bake while we go on with the next part. Are there any questions while I'm doing this? No questions, anyone? All good, you could all do this easily. Okay. There we go. Um, this is, I've got a little mixture left over. To give you an idea, I made half because I just produce too much stuff to eat and there's no one to eat it. There's not a whole school to eat it. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Lucky thirteen, a baker's dozen, and they're probably another four. So you're probably going to get close to eighteen twenty out of this. I'm just going to get my hands a wash. And so if you do double, you're probably going to get a good three dozen particularals. Um to use and they're going to pop up. And what I'm going to do with mine is I am going to fill them with cream and strawberries. You could do lemon curd, you could and cream. Uh, there we go, we've got the oven nice and hot and I'm just going to pop them in to, onto a tray. There we go. I didn't um, uh, rearrange it, so there we go. And we'll pop them into the oven. I think the recipe probably tells you for about 20 minutes uh, for small eclairs. Um, what you want to do is you want a very crisp outside. So again, it depends on your oven. If your oven, if you look at them and they feel a bit soggy, put them back in because you want them nice and crisp on the outside. Some people even used to put them in the airing cupboard to try and dry them after they'd cooked them. I haven't done that, but uh, it gives you an idea of how dry some people want them to be. So now we've got our artichokes boiling away. They aren't, haven't quite come up to the boil yet. In fact, they've just turned themselves off. And I must have turned it off because I don't think they do that on their own. And then, um, when they boil, we'll take them out and they'll be ready for our vinaigrette. Our eclairs or our profiteroles are in the oven baking. You don't open the oven with profiteroles or for the first maybe 15 minutes, just leave them. Because if you open the oven, a rush of air can push them down. For some reason, they're a little bit temperamental. So we just put them in, forget about them. And we will fill them with cream, cut them, fill them with cream, and then we'll sprinkle some icing sugar over the top. Now, my, one of my favorite desserts is the chocolate mousse. With the chocolate mousse, all we are going to do is we are going to take the chocolate. I have bought chocolate pieces. You can break chocolate, take chocolate and break it up. And, or you can buy chocolate discs. If you go online to somewhere like chocolate trading, they will sell bags of these little discs and it's quite nice because they don't need any work done to them. But you want to be very careful with your chocolate because chocolate very easily um, uh, splits. It's very temperamental. So we're going to be careful what we do with our chocolate. I'm going to take a bowl and I'm going to put it into a saucepan but you must make sure that it doesn't touch the water because if the water touches the bottom of your bowl, it's too hot and it'll affect the chocolate. It will 
could make it split or get very hot. Take our chocolate and then we go. I'm using a 55% chocolate here. No sugar at all. All I'm using is the chocolate. Um, it's got more than enough sugar in it. And all I'm going to do is pop it on to the heat and I'm going to let it, I let it come up to the boil first of all, and then I'll turn it down. So there we go. We'll just leave that up to the boil and then down. And then what we will do is we will have to get a few more eggs. We're going to take three whole eggs and we're going to take five egg whites. We've added an extra two egg whites to the recipe because we think that adding that extra egg white actually makes it much lighter and fluffier. And then we're going to add, once we've beaten the egg yolks, we'll take, let me start again, we'll take the egg yolks, we'll separate them. We'll beat the egg whites separately. The egg yolks we will beat, I will show you how to do that, and we will add olive oil to it. So we'll have egg yolks and olive oil, and then we'll add the hot chocolate to that. And then we'll fold in the egg whites and we're going to add some brandy. I like quite a lot of brandy in it, but you can put as much or as little as you like. And then we will spoon them into some glasses for serving. I'm just going to grab another two eggs um, and hopefully these eggs will be fine. Um, hang on one sec. There we go. I've got another two eggs here and one, two eggs. I'm just going to grab a bowl to divide them into. Here we go. Having... And I'm just peeping, keeping an eye on that. That chocolate is doing fine. I'm going to get a spoon or a spatula is equally fine. Just now, I will just stir them so that we keep the chocolate melting evenly if we have to stir it. So let's divide our eggs up. What I'm going to do, I'm going to um, beat them with the machine because beating by hand will take ages and I just want to show you the principle. If you want to beat um, yourself by hand, then that is absolutely fine. So there we go. Se separate them all again and we'll get the whites. We want a bowl with nothing in it because if we have a horrible egg white, it will contaminate the whole lot. Also, when you're breaking up eggs this way, if while you're doing it, one of your eggs breaks, this one has, it means, and I've got a bit of egg white into this, egg yolk into this, which I have, it wouldn't beat up. Really good. One of the things about cookery school is when we must make mistakes, we share them. And interestingly enough, I don't know if you can see a bit, a tiny bit of egg yolk has got in there. And you cannot have egg yolk in anything if you're beating them uh, simply, because your eggs simply will not be up simply. So I will use that in a frittata. Whoops. I will use that in a frittata. Um, Let's pop that again. Okay, there we go. Let's see how that will work. These eggs have said they've got about um, a three week date on them. But in fact, um, they don't feel like they've got three weeks to go. In fact, I think I'm going to have enough egg there because I'm adding some egg white which I've kept from before to it. And you won't believe what we do. Every time we have egg white left over, we simply freeze it. So when I need extra eggs, as I do now, I've always got a supply of white. But these, this white here can only be used for cooking. It's not going to do very well. And I've got another little bit of egg left there from early on. It's not going to do very well otherwise. So let's just get this out. I'm going to need another little whisk and I'll come back to the chocolate. Look at the chocolate. It was getting quite hot so I'm just going to turn it right down so it melts away slowly. And if you have a look you'll see 
how it's starting to melt. Can you see the chunks there and it's melting, but it's pretty hot. It's boiling underneath, a bit too hot. So I'm just taking it off for a moment for the cooker to cool down a wee bit. And then I'll put this back on. But you can see they're still getting liquidy, but there's still bits in it. So we'll put that on lower and leave that to cook. Now, while that's melting, I'm going to beat my eggs. And I'm going to beat all this egg yolk. All, all this egg yolk is going to take this oil. I'm going to put a drop of oil in at a time. Almost as if though I'm doing um, a mayonnaise. I just want it to absorb all this oil. So I'm just going to beat it all in. If you were doing this, I would use um, organic eggs so that you know you've got an egg that's really, really safe there. And this egg has got a bit of parsley in it. No idea why, but it had. And I'll just get that out. And you beat them together. And you just beat it. Don't need repetitive strain on this. You just beat it until it's absorbed all the oil. And another bit of parsley. I can't think why there's a bit of parsley in there. It's definitely parsley, bright green. Oh well, these things happen. I have been cooking with a lot of parsley. So it might have been on something that I didn't see. Beat it in again until all of this oil is absorbed. That's all we're doing. There we go. You can see they together, they haven't split at all. So it's really very oily egg yolk. If you think that it looks very rich, it's going to feed a lot of people. I'm just checking the chocolate again. There's still little pieces of chocolate. I'll show you if I lift it. So we want all those little pieces of chocolate in. I'm just cleaning the bowl down the side so we keep it clean. There we go. And I'll add the last of the oil. So it's dark chocolate and olive oil, both good for you. And of course, eggs are always fine these days. And while I'm adding the chocolate to this, I'm going to beat the egg whites. So you won't hear me for a little bit. Whoops. You'll just have me hear this beating up. Nice and stiff, and we're going to look at the chocolate. Almost there. And I'm going to slowly add the chocolate chocolate on in a steady stream onto the egg. And the final lot goes in. Here we go.
nest of iguanas. And here the egg whites are. If you want to test that your egg whites are stiff enough, you're supposed to be able to put them over your head. But this is slipping around, so I'm not going to test that. What I'm going to now do is I want to soften this mousse a little bit. Um, it's quite firm. If I show you, you'll see it's gone quite firm. So what I want to do is add a bit of egg white to it. I'll use a big spoon. It's the best thing to do when adding egg white. I'm going to take a big spoonful, I'm going to put it in, and I'm just going to fold it over and over. Can you see? I'll hold it up. I'll show you what I'm doing. I'm cutting it and I'm lifting it and putting it over. It's a small bowl. It doesn't matter because I'm not going to be using it for long. I'm just going to do this. So just over and over. I'm not stirring around. I'm cutting and going over. Cutting and dropping it. Cutting and dropping it. Until all that egg white has disappeared. Cutting and dropping, cutting and dropping, cutting and dropping. Okay, once I've done that, I'm going to take it all and I'm going to put it in with the egg white. It was, you could see, if you look at it now, it's much softer than it was when I first showed it to you. And then I'm going to take the spoon and I'm going to use the same cutting over and over I'm dropping it, lifting and dropping and cutting, lifting, dropping and cutting over and over until I incorporate all that egg white into the chocolate. I'm going to stand back to do it so I can use this arm and show you. It's, at the moment, you can see it's very mottled. It's not mixed through. I want to mix it through completely. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to add my brandy. And the brandy just gives it such a lovely flavor. The brandy and the chocolate together are really, really gorgeous. I'm just going to step back so you can see me doing it, but I've got to keep it quite low, I'm afraid. This arm doesn't work brilliantly and it needs um, a nice firm hand. So there we go. You can see now, there are no bits of, um, a little bit of egg white up there, I'll just get rid of it, put it in, and there we have a lovely, lovely mousse. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to take it and I'm going to put it into those dishes. I'm terribly messy. So, to help me, I use a jam funnel. And I'm just going to stir it, spoon it in, so that if it messes anywhere, um, it won't, I think it will need two spoonfuls each probably. There we go. And that's it. One. Jam funnel into this one. I'll move it out of the way because I am liable to mix. One. Two. And then we'll do the third one. You can see I'm quite right to move them out of the way because I am spilling a bit. One, two, we'll get four out, four nice ones. Whoops, that was messy and we don't want any mess at all. Okay, and then the final one, one, and then all the little bits that are going to be here, we'll probably just make a second one, um, but I'm going to need a spatula to scrape out all the bits that are left here. We don't want to waste a bit of it, so I'll just get rid of all of that. There we go. and fill that up. 
last one, and we've got four lovely mooses. If you want to give people less than that, you'd probably be able to get six little ramekins out of it. And there we go. I'll just use a teaspoon to assist me getting the last little bit sore. There we go. So we get it all out. When you get a little bit of a mess on your um, uh, container, straight away just clean it up because you really don't want it to go to the kitchen and to the table looking messy from the kitchen. So just give it a really good clean up always. So one of the secrets really about making your food look lovely is keeping it as clean as you can. So there we go. I will just clean that up where I've spilled. And we now have a chocolate and olive oil, chocolate and olive oil mousse. If you are a little short, you can see that one is a little bit smaller than another one. We'll just take a little piece of that and we'll pop it onto here so they get a more or less even. There we go. And then I'm going to pop it straight into the fridge. This one's got a little mess on it. There we go. It's almost clean. And I'll pop it into the fridge. And that's got to set for about an hour. And we will look at it at the end of that time. And you'll see they taste absolutely, you'll see how set they are. And they're wonderful. But these days, we have a lot, I'm just washing my hands. These days, we have a lot of people that are asking us for vegan alternatives. So at cookery school, we do a lot of experimenting. So we did a great big bit of experimenting and we've come up with the most gorgeous vegan option now. So I'm going to quickly show you how we do the vegan one. And what we do on the vegan one is same thing, melt our chocolate. I'll just put the chocolate, there we go, chocolate over the water and we'll let that melt. And what do we use instead of egg white? Instead of egg white, we use aquafaba. Aquafaba is the liquid that comes out when chickpeas are particularly good. So this morning I drained a tin of chickpeas took out all the liquid. I think it came, interestingly enough, the recipe, I think we must have measured it, asked for about 160 milliliters of aquafaba. And so I measured it and um, it was exactly 160 milliliters. So we will take the aquafaba and we will treat it exactly like egg white. We'll just beat it until it's stiff. But with the difference is this time, we're going to beat the, the um, olive oil straight into the chocolate. So we'll beat the olive oil into the chocolate and then we will fold the aquafaba in and add a bit of brandy. So it's very, very similar, probably much more simple, but it works beautifully. Last week we made an aquafaba um, mayonnaise. And that was delicious. I don't know whether anyone's tried it yet, but it does work a treat. I'm going to have to whisk this up. So I'm just going to grab a, the bowl. You won't be able to see this because I'm using a metal one. At Cuckoo School, we have lots of glass ones, but I didn't bring enough glass ones home to allow me to do two. And I'll just grab the beater and we'll let that beat. Are there any, any questions in the meanwhile? anyone? Any questions? Or are you all so clear on everything that you have no problem with, with anything to date? Everyone fine? Right. I'm just going to dry this because I had to wash it again. And I'm going to have a look to see how our profiteroles are doing. They're doing very nicely. They're very golden. I'll just give them a little while more so they can dry.
Now, there are, so, the mousse is made exactly the same way, except with aquafaba instead of egg white. Are you all okay on that? I'm going to um, while I wait for the chocolate. While I wait for the chocolate to melt, it is starting to melt. And while I wait for it to melt, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what I do with lettuce, with will, with the um, the wilted lettuce, so we can get that going. Um, I can see why I have parsley stuck to something. Right. Um, I'm going to, you can either griddle your lettuce on a griddle or you can do it on a tray in the oven. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take mine and I'm going to put it onto a tray in the oven. And what I'm going to do here, just cut the bottom of the lettuce off and cut it in half, lengthways, so it looks pretty. There we go. If you want to, you can even cut it in quarters. There we go. This wasn't a wilted one. I was saving a wilted one up. And about two days ago, I asked my daughter if she'd found seen the lettuce. She said, yes, she'd eaten it. So I'm afraid keeping one to show you a wilted lettuce didn't quite work. But there you go. That's just one little baby gem. They go quite far, as you can see because the one baby gem would, I would think, serve two people. And when the profiteroles come out of the oven, I'm going to take this and I am going to pop that into the oven, under the grill, and, or into a very hot oven, whichever you prefer. I've just put some olive oil underneath and on top. Um, olive oil gives things wonderful flavor and it is really good for you. I know you're going to hear me say that often. Um, right. And we will take that as soon as the profiteroles are out and we will riddle them. Let's see how our chocolate's doing. The chocolate is starting to melt, just a little way more to go. And then we're going to take the, um, whoops, we're going to take the egg white and we're going to beat it good and solid. I don't believe that I have another small whisk. I'm sorry, I've just got to grab a clean whisk because of um, the little problem I had. I used uh, the whisk that I had, I used it all up. So I'm just giving it a quick wash and I'll be back with you in a flash. There we go. Right. Clean whisk because we want a little whisk to whisk the, um, the olive oil into the chocolate. How's this doing? It's coming on. Still little pieces in it, and you can't rush chocolate. Chocolate has got a mind of its own, so we'll just wait for that. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put the make little ramekins rather than make the glass ones, just for some variety. Um, and then, just to keep you informed of what we're going to do, once we have um, made the mousse. I'm then going to show you how to make an anchovy dressing for the lettuce and I'll show you how to make a vinaigrette for our gorgeous artichokes. The artichokes have been cooking away, they've been held down nicely by the water, some of their water has gone, so I'm just going to add a little more water to it. And then by the time we've done everything, those artichokes should be ready. I don't think they're quite ready yet. They look as if they need a little more cooking. And I think our chocolate is almost there. There we go, just about there. And I'll bring it over, show it to you. That's our chocolate. You can see there no, there's a little bit in it, tiny bit. I'll just dissolve that. There we go, now smooth chocolate. Get rid of that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the olive oil to the chocolate and I'm going to beat the aquafaba that's really, really thick. I'll turn that on and I will do this at the same time. 
into here and it's going to set hard as it goes anyway as it cooks. I'm just going to do it I did last time. Fold in the aquafaba. There we go. It's all a bit looser but it doesn't matter. Strong egg um, mixture there into our mixture here. And then we're going to fold it up, fold it in, not folding it up. And I'm just mixing the two over and over and over and over and over until, at the moment you can see they're not mixed together, we'll mix them together until they're all mixed together. Almost there, over and over. This is, um, and then I'm going to pop them into the ramekins. There we go, it's all one color now, it's not marbled anymore. And then all we're going to do is we're going to pop it in to the ramekins and that will, that will cook. Um, I'm just finding another one of these. There we go, and I'm just going to pop that in, and through that one. Two. Three. Four. Five. 
six. It should do six. I haven't made them quite full enough, so I'm just going to chop them up a wee bit. And then into the fridge, and there we go. Our aquafaba mousse. Not an egg inside. I'm going to pop those into the fridge quickly, and then I will be back to show you the profiteroles. Wait one moment while I pop these in safely. them in now, I was thinking they would probably make the most, most delicious mousse. If you put that um, ice sort of mousse, um, if you put that in an, almost an ice cream, I think if you put those little aquafaba ones, I wouldn't do it with the egg one, but I think if you put those aquafaba ones into the freezer, you get a sort of a really delicious flavor because they're very airy and they taste yummy. So let's have a look at what happens with our profiteroles. You remember that they were just lumps of dough. And look at these beautiful profiteroles that we've got now. And I'm going to take our lettuce, I'm going to pop it into the oven right near the top and we want it really to char we want it to cook really well and get a little char on it so i will do that i will turn the oven up a bit so we get a really high oven just to wilt them a bit and then we'll end up by letting them char so i think we're almost let's have a little look pop these out the way just to cool. I think I'm going to actually put them onto a cold tray because if I do this they'll come off the hot tray and they'll cool ever so quickly so I can pull one or two for you just to show you how lovely they are. But I mean there you go, not hard and in a short while you've turned out a whole batch of them. Right, so let's pop that here because I will use this afterwards to make the next set of dough. And I will show you how you make the two dressings very, very quickly. They're ever so quick. So if you're making the vinaigrette, first of all, vinaigrette is a classic French dressing. Vinegar, I'm using cider vinegar but you can use ordinary wine vinegar and you can use powdered mustard or prepared mustard. The mustard is a very important part of the vinaigrette because the mustard is what emulsifies this dressing together. Mustard is an emulsifier. You might remember that I love a garlic press. So I'm going to press some garlic into it. Here we go. Whoops. Very big clove of garlic there. Just it's so big, I'll use it on both things actually. And some salt. And then we're going to put in our olive oil. I did something very silly because I was going to, I was thinking of getting done so quickly. You should really dissolve your mustard in, that was really silly of me, mistake, so you learn, your mustard at the bottom is in the vinegar. I'm not going to mix in the olive oil. I was going to shake the mustard and the vinegar together until they were dissolved. Because if you throw the mustard into your dressing, we are very often find we get blobs of mustard in the dressing. So the trick is, and I can still do it because the olive oil's on the top. Um, mix the mustard in with the vinegar before you add your olive oil. Don't do what I do, do what I say, please. 
Um, so, what I would have done, should have done, but it saved the day, put your vinegar in, put your mustard in, shake them together, and then add your oil. You can add your salt at any time. And you just shake it together and you get this gorgeous yellow vinaigrette. Most delicious vinaigrette, but very important with everything. Taste, please. Perfect amount of salt. And that is our vinaigrette. Couldn't be much easier. I'll just show you how to make the anchovy dressing, which is very similar, but instead of vinegar, I use lemon juice. So let's take our garlic, pop our garlic in. I'm going to do that with it. Pop the garlic in. Needs a nice lot of garlic, okay? Pop the garlic in. Then we're going to pop in a whole tin of anchovies. Loads of people don't like anchovies, but the number of people we have converted to liking anchovies after they've tried this dressing are more than I can count. If you tell them it's anchovy dressing, they say, oh, I don't eat anchovies. But if you just beg them just to have a tiny taste, they say, oh, mm, that tastes okay. I think the reason is because of the umami in the um, anchovies. Umami is the thing that gives you that moorishness in food. So they taste it and they want more. Lemon juice, so it's garlic, lemon juice, anchovy, and your olive oil. All slung in, and all I do is I just blitz them together. There we go. What you want to make sure of is that there are no little bits of anchovies. I mean, I actually love little bits of anchovies. I leave a bit, I don't mind. But if you happen to be serving it to someone that isn't an anchovy lover, you don't want to leave any bits of anchovy as telltale story that there's no anchovy to see. You cannot believe how delicious that is. It is more delicious than I can describe. So let's have a look quickly at the artichokes. I will show you how to finish off your profiteroles and we're there folks. So there we go. Let's have a look at our artichokes and see what they've done. I will just grab one of these and show you. I'm going to, it's very hot, but if I take my hand, you saw that just pulled off. It took no pressure. And when you eat them, you eat only that. And it's soft and delicious. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that and I'm going to just pour the boiling water off. It's great to have all that boiling water in the sink because it's melting the bits of chocolate that are on the bowl. So there we go. And then what I do is I take a nice bowl to keep it in the fridge and just pop it into a bowl like that. It's pretty hot, so I'm going to use a paper towel. Paper, as you know, is a poor conductor of heat, so it helps. There we go. In they both fit into a bowl. Whoopsie. Doesn't matter because it's only for using now. And we're going to take the dressing and we're going to pour some dressing over it, just so that it soaks in everywhere. And then I will just leave them in the fridge to marinate like that. And that is your artichoke vinaigrette. The other thing you can do that is very delicious with artichokes is you can take them hot and just do brown butter and while they're hot, you can serve them 
and you dip each little leaf in brown butter. And when you come to the choke, of course, you just cut that out. You can see it and it lifts out very, very easily. Okay, final bit of the day is to show you how to finish off your profiteroles. We'll just take one or two and you take them and you cut them this way, like an oyster, just so that it opens. These are beautifully crisp. There's no wetness in them at all. So I'll just do three for you. I've just taken three random ones. And we're going to fill them with cream, but I thought, because it's midsummer, it would be really lovely to fill them with strawberries and cream. As I said to you earlier, lemon curd mixed with cream is delicious. Or you can just do pure cream and with your cream um, in the middle, you can put a hot chocolate sauce on the top. Um, you can make a perfectly good um, chocolate sauce. If you, this cream has softened a wee bit. I beat it quite slick, but it softened a bit, so I'll only fill one. Um, there we go. You just take your cream and your strawberries, you pop it into the middle. I want to just beat the cream again so that it's stiff before I fill the others. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to fill it, there you go, with that. And then what you do is you take your icing sugar and to get a really professional finish, you always put your icing sugar through a small strainer. And you just take your icing sugar, pop it through a strainer like that, and you put a nice, let's move it out the way so you can see, you put a nice coating of icing sugar over each of your profiteroles. And there you have a profiterole filled with strawberries and cream and a real, real spoil. I guess you want me to show you what the chocolate mousses look like. I'll show you one of those before we say goodbye. It's still a bit soft, it needs longer setting in the oven, but there you go. Oh, I haven't shown you the lettuce. There that is. I'll have to take a taste for you. Delicious. Mm. The lettuce, let me just show you the lettuce. And all you're going to do is drizzle some of this sauce over it. Um, the lettuce is starting to char. There we go, you can see within a few minutes, it's started to char beautifully. Can you see? It's gone crispy over there. I like it really burnt, but I will just show you what we do so that it looks yum. You can just, I'll just take one piece because I'll put it back in for a moment, but I want to show you, you can see it's quite, quite charred. I'm just going to take a bit of this dressing and pour it over it. There you go. And that, two pieces of that, with a piece of freshly baked bread or cornbread or soda bread or something like that is a perfect starter. Or we sometimes even put them on the plate as part of a veg. So that is it. I've rushed through the last things. I hope that you've all managed to feel you can make it again at home. If you have any questions, please ask us at Cookery School about where you're going wrong or advice on stuff. We're always happy to answer your questions.